there is a large amount of activity approaching Khan Yunus. What can you tell us about that? So Israel's goal in this operation is to destroy Hamas's military machine and take apart their political control over the Gaza Strip. And we can talk later why that is necessary. But it's clear that in the southern part of the Gaza Strip, specifically around the area of uh, Khan Yunus, there is crucial uh, Hamas infrastructure, both military infrastructure and political uh, control mechanisms. There are tunnels, you have bunkers, you have underground fortifications, you have Hamas command and control. And we believe that in the area of Khan Yunus, you also have senior Hamas commanders. And it's crucial for us to go in there and take out those targets as part of our operation to destroy Hamas. Just how significant is it to take out that leadership? What kind of impact will that have on the rest of Hamas should the IDF be successful in that aim? So decapitating the leadership of a terrorist organization is always important. You recall how everyone in the West reacted when Osama bin Laden was taken out finally. And that's a victory over uh, Al-Qaeda. And taking out the Hamas's senior leadership will be the, a similar sort of victory. As this is going on, there has been a significant barrage of rockets fired at many areas in Israel. What is the latest in that situation? So it's true, since they ended the ceasefire, refusing to release more hostages that they hold, that forced a, a, a return to combat. And since that happened, we've had barrage after barrage of rockets. Thank goodness the Israeli civilian population is protected through the Iron Dome system, which allows us to shoot down incoming rockets at very, very high percentage levels. And so the fatalities on our side have been low, but that's not because Hamas hasn't been trying. They're trying very hard to kill our people. We've just been effective in protecting our people. For you, there is obviously no equivalence between one group trying to murder as many people as possible and another group trying to murder the people behind those atrocities and civilian casualties getting caught up in crossfire. People often talk about international uh, humanitarian law and the, and the rules of armed conflict. And one of the foundation principles there is what we call distinction, distinction between civilians and between combatants. Civilians must be protected and combatants are a legitimate target. And then if you look at Israel, we're making every effort to try to keep civilians out of harm's way as we attack Hamas. That's why we've given so much time in advance to urge people to leave areas where we know that there's going to be combat. Hamas, on the other hand, their whole being is based on targeting civilians. Hamas is obviously targeting civilians. We saw the terrible crimes they committed against the Israeli civilian people, the population in the south, the young people at the rock concert, yes? The way they raped, the way they beheaded, the way they burned entire families alive. The way they just randomly shot people driving on the road or they went into houses in rural communities and just butchered everyone, yes? It's maybe surprising for, for some, but everyone knows, or most people know Hamas's brutality towards the Israeli civilian population. But they sometimes forget how brutal Hamas is with their own Palestinian population. And we see that in the way that they use Gazan civilians as a human shield for their military machine. Why else do you build uh, your command and control and your network of terror tunnels underneath hospitals. You store your missiles in schools and in mosques and, and you use civilian neighborhoods under which you, be, you bury your military machine. According to international humanitarian law, this is a double war crime. Why? Not only do you target Israeli civilians, which is a war crime, you also use your own civilians as a human shield, war crime number two. So it's, it, it, Hamas really is a barbaric and horrific terrorist organization. And anyone who compares that with a democratic country that's trying its best to defend its people and, and honor the rules of, of armed conflict, there's no comparison. I, and I, I, I reject any symmetry. The rockets are still coming. How confident are you that the IDF is taking out that terror rocket infrastructure? And was the ceasefire a mistake? We don't think the, the, the pause was a mistake because we got out over 100 people of them over 80 Israeli uh, civilians. From our point of view, every life that you can save is, is wonderful, yes? And so even though there was a risk, and you're right in the question, there was a risk in agreeing to a pause because that gave Hamas a rest and a, an ability to, to re reorganize. But nevertheless, we got 80, uh, over 80 Israelis out and altogether more than 100 if we count the foreign nationals who were released. That's a good thing. And, and the reports we're hearing now, especially from the medical team, 
about how those hostages was, were treated, truly horrific. Uh, the head of the children's hospital where some of the children are being treated gave a briefing earlier and she talked about uh, the children coming out of Gaza and what they've gone through, yes. And so by getting them out, I think we saved lives. And it was a price worth paying, though it was a calculated risk. And we would have actually agreed to the continuation of that humanitarian pause if Hamas had continued to release hostages. It was Hamas that ended the pause by, by, by not following through on its own commitments under the negotiations, under the agreements reached. And in fact, Hamas opened fire before we did. They, they started this round of fighting. And so if the people of Gaza are complaining that, you know, about this war, they really should be pointing their finger at Hamas, which not only started the war with their barbaric, horrific attacks on Israel on October 7th, but the, the, the reason the ceasefire ended, the pause ended precisely because Hamas decided to end it by its own behavior. The UK government has confirmed that some unmanned drones will be helping with the surveillance of Gaza in terms of trying to locate hostages. How confident are you with that tactic and the increased pressure from the IDF on Hamas infrastructure that that will lead to further hostage releases? So Hamas is not going to suddenly release hostages because they've become humanitarians. They're not Boy Scouts. We have no illusions about who they are. They are a barbaric, extremist, fanatical terrorist organization. And if they are to release hostages in the future, it's only like in the past, they'll do so because they feel compelled to do so. Because once again, they'll beg for a ceasefire, a timeout, and we will only agree to do that if we uh, get our hostages back. And so we firmly believe in Israel that by beefing up the military pressure on Hamas, we're not only hitting their, them hard, we're not only destroying their military machine, we're not only taking out their senior commanders, but in so doing, we're expediting the future release of, of more of the hostages and we want them all out. We're not going to rest until every one, last one of them is out. This is not August 1945. There's not going to be a letter of surrender in the way that we saw with Nazi Germany or Japan. How will you know when you've won? How do you judge that? So first of all, when we've succeeded in eliminating the Hamas senior command, when we have destroyed their military machine, with their underground subterranean a network of fortresses and tunnels and bunkers and arms depots and missile launching sites when all that is destroyed and when Hamas no longer controls the Gaza Strip and you know when that will happen uh, there'll be a clear sign because finally the people of Gaza will be able to speak out because at the moment every time a media organization interviews someone in in Hamas controlled territory you get the party line yes it's all Israel's fault and Israel is doing terrible things and so forth and so on the minute you hear people say well Hamas started this war and they only care about themselves and they don't give a hoot for the people of Gaza and, and they have brought this carnage on, Ga uh, on the Gaza Strip and they are responsible. The minute you start hearing things like that, which we know Gazans feel very, uh, very widely, those sort of thoughts, uh, there, is, there is pent up anger amongst the Palestinian population of Gaza against Hamas for bringing this crisis upon them. And so the minute you as a journalist, David, start hearing these things, That'll be a sign that Hamas's political control of Gaza has evaporated and that this is coming to an end. It's not the only front that is opening up, potentially. There has been activity uh, on the Lebanese border with uh, Hezbollah. Tell us exactly what you assess to be the latest there. So you've got a front on the Lebanese border. And uh, at the moment, most of the fighting there has been contained to the border area, but where under no illusions, uh, uh, Hezbollah could escalate further. And if they do, we will have to respond. And my only message to Hezbollah would be that they have to be aware that if they escalate this conflict, uh, it won't be October 7th. Israel will not be taken by surprise. We have mobilized, our forces are ready in the north. And if they do force an escalation, Israel will respond decisively. I urge them not to escalate. We're not interested in escalation, but if they force an escalation, we will respond uh, expeditiously and decisively. But there are other fronts as well. You know uh, uh, that uh, around the uh, international seaways, uh, where I think uh, some 15% of world trade uh, has to pass the coast of Yemen and that going up through to the Suez Canal. And there you've seen another uh, Iranian proxies. I mean, you've got Hamas in Gaza, you've got Hezbollah in Lebanon, and you've got the Houthis in Yemen. And uh, they have been attacking international shipping. There are all these laws and conventions and UN resolutions against this sort of piracy on the high seas. 
Obviously, the Houthis couldn't be doing this without Iran, just as Hezbollah couldn't be doing what it's doing without Iran, just as Hamas would not have the weapons and the capabilities it has without Iran. And I think uh, uh, this attack to the free seas, to the open seas, I mean, Britain uh, knows more about this than everyone else because you were historically a, a maritime uh, uh, power. And, and the fact that uh, uh, Iranian proxies, the Houthis, are attacking shipping on the high seas, this is something the international community can't sit silently about. There has to be a forceful response. How satisfied are you with the response of, of America and others to, to what's been going on in the Red Sea? So on the whole, of course, we're very happy with both the American and the UK government, which have given Israel strong support. I mean, uh, they've said Israel has a right to defend itself. They say Israel, of course, has the right to destroy Hamas. They say there should be a new situation in Gaza where Hamas is no longer running the show. Uh, that, is, that, is, that is agreed to. Uh, of course, we have conversations on this or that other issue. Uh, uh, some of our friends and allies would say, well, just, you know, get her over done quickly and, and with the minimum civilian casualties. And there's, there's a bit of tension between those two things, because if you want it done quickly, that affects the ability to keep civilian casualties low. And what we are, we are really uh, trying to keep casualties as, as low as we can amongst the civilian population. You are, of course, incurring losses at the same time. How much stomach is there for the fight across Israel as, as the sad news comes in of, of IDF soldiers losing their lives? So no one wants to, to see losses of our soldiers. Obviously, we have a civilian army and many of the people being killed are reservists. They have families, they have children. When we read their names in the newspaper or watch the, the funerals on television, it's, it's heartbreaking. These are often our finest young men and uh, every loss is a tragedy. But I think there's an understanding in Israel that this is a war that has to be fought and has to be won. I mean, what is the alternative? To leave Hamas in power in Gaza and, and for them to attack us again like they did on October 7th and, and butcher our people? Uh, one Hamas uh, leader said a few days ago, they believe in permanent war with Israel. And, and another one said that they would do the October 7th attacks again and again and again. Given, given the opportunity, given the capability. We have to deny them the opportunity. We have to deny them the capability. And I think you see a wall-to-wall -wall consensus in Israel about the need to destroy Hamas. We refuse. Israelis simply refuse to live any longer next to this terror enclave on our southern border and live in fear that terrorists are going to cross the border in the middle of the night and butcher our children. No, we refuse to live that way. I think any people British people, French people, German people would refuse to live in any a parallel reality like that. And we are totally within our rights to destroy Hamas's military machine and destroy their territorial enclave in the Gaza Strip. And we will do so. And the truth is, we will do so no matter what, because Israel doesn't have a choice. And we know we've got many friends in the world that will understand that we have to do that. It's not a war that we started. It's a, not a war that we wanted. But now that this war has been forced upon us, we must win and we will win decisively. And we know there will be costs. We know we're going to lose more of our soldiers in battle, but there is no alternative. This is a job that has to be done. This nation may be united behind this war effort right now, but you know that there is a reckoning to be had for the intelligence failures that led to the October 7th massacre. When will those hearings begin? And is that information being gathered already to ensure that something like this doesn't happen again? So it's clear October 7th was a, was a massive failure, a failure that we paid for in the blood of our people. They took us by surprise. They crossed the border. They massacred our people. I think it took us a few days before we actually uh, neutralized all the terrorists who had crossed into Israeli territory. And when this is over, there will be an, a thorough investigation. Uh, we have a history in Israel of of after military mishaps like this, we have what you would call in Britain, royal commissions, uh, independent commissions of inquiry, where we look at exactly what happened, where witnesses are brought to testify as high up as the prime minister, the minister of defense, the chief of staff of the military, the head of intelligence, the head of Mossad, the head of the Shin Bet, all the way down to field officers on the ground. Everyone will be asked questions. Everyone will be asked to give his an opinion. In the end, decisions will be made. You know, we have a tradition in this country of, of when something's gone wrong, investigate, learn the lessons. I mean, the truth is Israel is going to continue to live in a, in a, a very unstable part of the world. Yes, we're part of the Middle East. We're not going anywhere and the Middle East is not going anywhere. And we have to be good. We as Israelis, we pride ourselves on having very good intelligence. 
And the fact that they took us by surprise, uh, that, that is a major problem for us. And we have to correct any failings in our system.